I'm sending you to Kenya. And you won't be by yourself. You'll never be by yourself. And I, w I went in, you know, that morning and told everybody my dream. And I said, God said, I'm coming to Kenya. And everybody, you know, looking at me funny. <laughs> She'd had a bad dream. But when we was leaving, something in my heart said, you're coming back. You're coming back. That was 2002. After graduating from Kara's Bible College and spending some time at home, Dottie continued to feel God calling her to Kenya. Right from the very first, I knew that Kenya was my destiny. I, so I went to my brother and I said, God told me this morning, time to pack my bags, I'm going to Kenya. And he said, you can't just go to Kenya. How much money have you got? I said, I got enough for my plane ticket and $500. But when I got to Kenya, I said, this is where I belong. I know it was where I belong. So I came in November. I moved to Bungoma. I completely felt at home here. Then the children started coming. My life here in Kenya is preaching God's Word, and taking care of children. My Rachel, my firstborn, she's eight years old now. But when I got her, she was a newborn child in the hospital. Her mother had been molested and raped by her stepfather. She's called an incest child. She had left the baby at the hospital. So they gave me that baby. She was three days old. Every child I take has a story. From Andrew being starved to death, to Stevie, whose mother left her, him with his grandmother who couldn't take care of him. God knowed. God told me, I'm not sending you there to, to change Kenya. I'm sending you to change a few lives. So that's my job. Our day starts at five o'clock for the children. We have breakfast and get everybody ready for school. God has always uh, given me time to teach my children about God. I teach them how to pray. They know their little prayers at night. Our life here is finding good schools for my children, keeping them in, uh, in their schools. Everybody in this house knows about Andrew Womack and his wonderful wife, Jamie, because uh, they have always been a part of my life. If you look on my desk, my books I read, Andrew is a big part of uh, the children's upbringing because Andrew inspired me so. So they're inspired by Andrew too. It's already been done. The curse of sin has been broken. Jesus has paid for every person's sickness. When I was taught how God really was, it changed my life. And I want to teach people the same way that I got taught. I get to change these children's lives. They're blessed here, and they call me mommy. I'm called mommy because they love me. I hope to never, never leave one of these children, and I hope to start another home because we'll run out of space. We need a bigger, another house with another mother that wants the same thing that I want, to fulfill what God had planned for me. Dottie's home is currently at capacity. If she were to take in one more child, she would be forced to register as an orphanage in Kenya. She is believing for another mother to open a second house in Kenya so that abandoned children can continue to be adopted. I just want to thank Andrew Walmick and Jamie. They are called by God to give and they've given to me to change lives of people, of children that'll change Kenya. People gives to me 
is why I can give to other people. Thank you for giving me what I've got. It's a brand new life. <laughs> When you partner with Andrew Womack Ministries, a portion of your gift helps support CBC graduate Dottie Heyman as she continues to save and change lives in Kenya. even formed in your mother's womb, God already had determined a purpose for your life, a God-given purpose. God has a purpose to train you in what you're called to do, and I tell you, Karis Bible College is the place for that. Man, if you want a life change, come to Karis. Come on to Karis! The next two to three years could be the most powerful time of your life. You sit under the Word for four hours a day, for five days a week, for two or three years, I guarantee you, you are going to have God speak to you and start revealing purpose to you. Every one of you are created for a purpose. Do you know what that purpose is? I'd like to encourage you to call in and I know that God is speaking to many, many people, and you may have had the Lord touch you today. And if you just need somebody to touch and agree with you, the Scripture says, if any two of you agree touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father. So we have these people, I mean powerful people who love God and are equipped in the Word of God. They're there to pray with you and help you. The number is 719-635-1111. At 719-635-1111. You're watching Gospel Truth TV. Teaching God's unconditional love and grace. Good evening, my name is Daniel Bennett. Welcome to our Thursday evening Karis Live Bible Study. I'm very glad that you all are able to join us. 
And uh, I'm very excited about this hour today. And I want to start with a few announcements just to, to uh, set the stage, especially if any of you are new and haven't tuned in before. So uh, these are live because we want to interact with you. And so I encourage you to send in any questions that you may have. Um, if, they're, if they're connected to the topic, uh, they're much more likely to be answered, but we'll cover as many as we can. And so the way you can do that is go to the chat feature in whatever format you're watching. So whether in YouTube or Facebook or some other format, if you go to the chat section, um, I'll get some of those questions here that I'll be able to pass on and we'll get, have answers toward the end of the hour. So we'll have about 30 minutes or 25 minutes of teaching and the last 15 minutes or so will be for Q&A. So we encourage you to interact with us. Uh, we always love the question and answer section at the end. Uh, also, if you're watching on YouTube, we do want to encourage you to subscribe. And also, there's a little bell that if you hit the bell, it'll alert you whenever we have a new one coming up. So if you'd like to be alerted so that you don't miss any of these or so that you at least know when there's one waiting for you, we encourage you to subscribe. Um, I'd also like to mention that uh, we have a helpline here, one other way that you can interact. You know, we have a, a prayer line and a helpline that's open 24 hours a day, five days a week, and also open um, for um, part of the day for Saturdays and Sundays. And so if you feel stirred up and you want to call in and, and um, um, pray with somebody or have someone agree with you in prayer, you can call our phone number, and that is 719-635-1111. So again, that's 719-635-1111. So we do encourage you to call in for that. And... You can also donate through that number. So if you'd like to donate, depending on the format you're watching, there may be a donate button or a donate tab on the website. And you can also call into that number if you'd like to, to donate over the phone. You can also text the word GIVE, so G-I-V-E, to the number 844-887-0796. So I believe that's on your screen or it may not be right now, but 844 887 0796. So I believe that's on your screen now. Text the word give and you can give over your phone like that. So um, again, be, be sending in questions throughout the message as any come to you. But I'm excited now to introduce our speaker for the day. And this is Wendell Parr, the ministry ambassador for Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College. And he's um, the former director as well of Karis Bible College. And so um, please welcome Wendell Parr. I know he has an amazing word to share with all of you today. Well, good evening. It's good to be with you, Daniel, and with all of you that have tuned in. And uh, as I've been with Andrew for a number of years, I've kind of uh, wore all the hats in the ministry. Right, yeah. So tonight I've got a word I believe the Lord gave me to share with you that uh, if we pay attention to will be of value to us. And so I want you to open your Bibles. Uh, this is a Bible study, so you need to have your Bible out. And let's go to... Uh, Matthew chapter 21, and I'm going to read a few verses here, and then we're going to, and beginning with verse number 12, and probably most of you are familiar with this account, but maybe you haven't heard it presented in this fashion. Uh, so let's read it. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that, owe, uh, that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased, and said unto him, Hearst thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. So as we look at this, I want you to pay particular attention to the fact that he, it's called the temple of God. And, and by that uh, very statement, it tells us this is something that belonged to God. This was God's property, the temple of of God and their key words and it gives us beyond any doubt that this information this information tells us this is God's property now for just a few minutes uh, let's think back about the temple let's get a little history behind it here and of course you need to remember that when when God delivered uh, the children of Israel out, out of their bondage in Egypt 
uh, on, on the journey, God gave Moses specific instructions to build a tabernacle. And a lot of people have, have not understood what God wanted to accomplish through the tabernacle. But in Exodus uh, chapter 25 and verse number 8, it tells us just exactly why God wanted the temple built. Um, and the tabernacle it was in, in the, as they were journeying. And he said, I want you to make me a sanctuary that I may dwell with you or among you. From the very beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, when he created mankind, his desire was to be in the middle of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, he, was, he wanted to be so close that he breathed himself into uh, Adam and he intended uh, that to be the way it was, but they're sin they sinned, and of course God's Spirit departed out of them. Then when uh, they go through all these years and we come to the children of Israel, they're in bondage in Egypt, God delivers them out, and as they begin this journey, He instructs Moses and gives him very specific instructions to build this tabernacle, but the purpose of it, God said, I want a place that I can dwell in the midst of you. Mm -hmm. I want to be right in the middle of everything that you're doing. So uh, this is where God would meet with the, with the priest and, and, and the priest would come on behalf of the people. And this is where they would bring the sacrifices. This is where they would minister to the Lord on behalf of the people. And uh, there uh, it was a place that was called the holy place. And, and then in, in the middle was a place called the holy of holies that uh, uh, no one was able to enter in but the high priest. It was a very... Uh, and, and they emphasize holy mm -hmm. to the degree that if any sin was there unaccounted for, it meant instant death. Mm -hmm. That's how serious God was about keeping the, the tabernacle, uh, the holy place and the holy of holies, holy. Then years and years, and we're covering a lot of history here, but for the sake of time, we're, we're having to do it. You can check this out. In Second Samuel chapter 7, uh, David had become the king, and he began to be disturbed about the fact, the tabernacle, and he, he asked the question, he says, how is it that I can dwell in a house made of cedar, but God has to dwell in a tent? Mm -hmm. So David was concerned about how God was being uh, treated and, and how the uh, place that God dwelt was being treated, and he decided he wanted to do something about it, but God spoke through the prophet Nathan and said, David, you're not going to be able to build the, the temple, but your son, Solomon, is going to build uh, God a house. And, and this, is, this was God's instructions, and there were reasons for it. You read it in 1 Kings 5 and 1 Chronicles chapter 22. But like I say, we, we're just quoting those scriptures, and, and we're not looking them up for the sake of time. But it would be good if you could read it. So Solomon built a temple for the Lord. And we do want to read this. It's over in 1 Kings. So if you have your Bible, let's go over there because I want you to see this. 1 Kings uh, chapter 8. And uh, the temple has been built. And now, verse 1, Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes and the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel unto King Solomon in Jerusalem that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Athenum, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. And they brought up the ark of the Lord, and the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those did the priest and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for the multitude. And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof. Above, And they drew out the staves, that the end of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without, and there they are unto this day. There was nothing in the ark, save the two tab tables of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass, 
when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. So now here we we're, we're following this. It went from the tabernacle to the temple. Now the temple is being dedicated, and God makes Himself known, and in such a fashion that it says they couldn't even stand because of the very presence of God in the temple. Mm-hmm. So this is this was the temple of God. It was a holy place. It was a place to, to that was to be kept holy and reverenced because this is where God lived. Mm-hmm. This was God's house. But now over the years, and you can trace this through uh, the Old Testament, the people became very careless about the temple. And when God was not honored... You'll find out the temple would be destroyed. God's people would go into captivity. They would repent and then rebuild the temple. Now, here we come to where we are in Matthew. In the day of Jesus, they had turned the temple. Mm -hmm. This place that was dedicated, that was recognized as the dwelling place of God, uh, a holy place, the residence of God, they had turned the temple into a convenience store, basically. Mm-hmm. They, had, they could walk in, buy anything they needed for the sacrifices and offer it. And there was no presence, no glory of God there. Uh, this, is, this is what a contrast mm-hmm. from when the temple was dedicated, that the presence of God was so powerful that, that the priest couldn't stand because of his presence. It was just so awesome. And now... Because of the way the people just didn't acknowledge what it was, uh, the glory of God won there. Mm-hmm. And it was had turned into a place of, of change of money and, and et cetera. We don't know. We don't have a lot of detail of what all went in, but it certainly wasn't a, a place that was honoring the presence of God. Right. Now, this might not go over very well with a lot of, of, of Christians, but let's think about our churches today. Mm-hmm. And let's, let's wonder what's taking place in, in the majority of them. And, and the fact of the matter is, very few, and I, I, I say that cautiously, but I, I think I'm accurate in saying it. I've been, been doing this for a number of years. I've been in a number of churches, and, and uh, so I'm not picking on any particular one. But I'm saying the majority of the churches, uh, you do not, sense or feel or even are able to witness the presence of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Uh, The majority of churches today, you know what's going to happen before you even get there. Right. And and, uh, once again, I'm not trying to be critical or judgmental, but I'm trying to get uh, Christians to begin to think about what's going on in our churches. And of course, you know, uh, (laughs) there's a scripture over in in, uh, the book of Revelation. It's it's when uh, God is sending a message to the seven churches. And uh, there's a scripture in Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 20 that Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone would open, uh, if any man hear my voice open the door, I'll come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. You know, growing when in the early days of my walk with the Lord, uh, we would uh, be trained to go witness to people, mm-hmm. and uh, we would lead them down the Roman road, which people are familiar with, and, and then we would want to bring them to a decision time. And oftentimes, we would quote this scripture about, you know, He's probably knocking at your heart, and if you'll open up, He'll come in. And and I don't know that that's total misuse of the scripture but when we look at it in context he's addressing the church right and he's saying to the church i'm i'm standing at the door so what it, <laughs> what the scripture is saying is a lot of churches are not letting the presence of the lord be a part of what they're doing mm-hmm. and, and it's it, it's sad but like i said earlier most churches we can go to, we know what's going to happen before we get there there's no there's no recognition or 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 acknowledging the very presence of God to let God do what he's doing. Uh, and, and God has announced how many times that he doesn't change, mm-hmm. that I'm the Lord your God and I change not. And then we, 
move over into the New Testament and, and we're told that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when we study uh, Scripture and, and we study about Jesus and we study about the Father, uh, if they didn't change, then what we read they're doing in the Scriptures, they should be doing today. Right. So they're, they're, I'm not saying that every church service should be where nobody could stand because of the presence, but there ought to be one every once in a while that you recognize and sense and, and witness the very presence of God. And uh, it is possible, and, and I've been in those services, and, and I pastored a number of years, and uh, there were many occasions because we expected and we believed for God's presence to be there, and we allowed the Holy Spirit to have his liberty to do what he wanted to do. And the gifts of the Spirit would operate, and we'd see miracles, we'd see healings, we'd see people saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it was because we recognized and welcomed and honored the presence of God. Mm. And, and I know there are churches that are doing that today, but I'm saying the majority uh, have turned them into more what we're reading about in the temple here that Jesus went in and, and began to clean out. Now, uh, uh, there, there needs to be it, and, and, and we see it. Uh, even in the tabernacle, when it was the tent, uh, Moses couldn't enter in because of the presence and glory of God. Uh, we saw it just a minute ago, First uh, Kings 8. Uh, they couldn't minister because of the presence of God. It was so real. But now in the, in the very next chapter of Kings, in First Kings 9, God says to Solomon, you tell the people, it's all over with because they're not honoring me. They're going after other gods. And so, you know, forget it. It's, it's, my presence is not going to dwell with people that don't honor me and don't recognize me that they're going after other gods. And so uh, we move now to all these years later into the day of Jesus. And Jesus goes into the temple. And, and I want you to see here in Matthew 21, he was... Uh, not really pleased with what was going on there. But the minute that he cleansed it and, and, and told them, uh, he threw the people out. He turned the tables over. And immediately after Jesus did this, verse 14, immediately it says, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Mm -hmm. Immediately, in other words, what I'm saying, the presence and glory and the power of God was manifested when the temple was cleansed, and Jesus taught them what it was should be, what it should be. And then, uh, following that story, you saw that when he purified it, and this is the four main points I want to make. When he he got rid of of all the stuff that wasn't godly, well, immediately when he when the purity took place, he said it's supposed to be a house of prayer. Then power was manifested, and then praise began to come forth. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to notice in this account who got upset mm -hmm. when those things began to happen. Right. It was the people that should have been letting it happen because the priest, look here it says, the chief priest and the scribes, when they saw the wonderful thing that he did, were displeased. <laughs> I'm afraid that we that in the day in which we live, that if God showed up in some of the churches and began to manifest Himself, some of the preachers would be displeased. Mm -hmm. It would steal their thunder, and all the attention wouldn't be on them. It ruined the service. It would just mess their service up <laughs> yeah. terribly. Mm -hmm. And so, anyhow, what I want you to see here, and these are the four things that I wanted you to see, the four points. Purity must come. Prayer must take place. Power will be manifested and praise will come forth. Now, let's bring this down to where we live. Mm -hmm. Because we know that God has already announced He's not going to be dwelling in a temple made by hand. Mm -hmm. So now we have Scripture to tell us that our body, those of us that are believers, the Christian, your body has now become the temple of God. Mm -hmm. So that's, and, and you don't have to take my word for it. I want to read these scriptures to you. You may know them, but it doesn't hurt to rehearse them. First Corinthians, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he tells them in First Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, he says, Know you not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? 
And if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. All right, he, he's serious about his temple. Now we go right over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we read again, Paul writing to the church and says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, we, we've moved from a, a tent, the tabernacle, to a building called a temple. But now, under the new covenant that you and I live under, those of us that are born again, God, by His Spirit, is now taking up residence in us, and the Scripture is very clear. This now is the dwelling place of God. Mm -hmm. This is God's house. And guess what? He wants His house to be just as holy as the tabernacle in the wilderness and the temple that was built by Solomon mm -hmm. and the temple that Jesus cleaned out in Jerusalem. God is saying to you and I, I you are the temple of God, and God still requires Holiness <laughs> and purity. Uh, it, it's the place that God dwelt. Now, we always recognize God is a holy God. Mm -hmm. And and he says, you need to be holy. Now, does that mean that, that we operate in sinless perfection? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the fact that we recognize and honor. And, and see, when Paul was dealing with the church at Corinth, if you'll do a little reading there, you'll find out this church was a mess. Mm -hmm. Uh, all kinds of stuff was going on in it that was not uh, proper. They were getting drunk at the Lord's table. There was all kinds of sexual immorality. Uh, they were suing one another. It was just a mess. And when Paul, who had established that church, had found out about it, he wrote this letter to them. And if you read uh, 1 Corinthians six nineteen, like I think he said it, he looked at them and he said, What? Don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? In other words, he's saying, folks, if you realize that your body inside of you is where God dwells, how could you be doing those things that are so unholy right. when the Holy One is living on the inside of you? Mm -hmm. Now, I believe, and this is just my opinion, uh, but I believe there, there are multitudes of Christians that really don't have the revelation knowledge that God lives on the inside of them. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I told this time and time again in many different places, I, I know that to be a fact because pastor and I had experiences with people that on Sunday morning were as holy as anybody could be. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the week, they kind of did their own thing. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing that in, in society. They're saying, well, yes, uh, I believe this, but politically I believe something else. And, and we're not going to get into too much of that. But I had an instance one time when I was pastoring, a couple of that got into an argument, and, and uh, the husband had walked out and slapped his wife, and she called us, and we went to try to minister, my wife and I. And uh, I, I just left the house, and I said, well, I'm going to try to find your husband. I drove one block. There was a 7-Eleven on the right-hand side, and, and there was his car. So I pulled into the parking lot, walked in, didn't say anything to him. He was at the, at the checkout stand, and I just walked up behind him, still didn't say anything. And this was a guy that uh, there wasn't any doubt about the fact that he loved God. He was very exuberant and, and, and very uh, outgoing about his relationship with God. He was one of the dancers, clappers, praisers. I mean, he was, he was turned on Christian. Mm -hmm. But he'd had this argument, and there he was in 7-Eleven. I walked up behind him, and he was buying a package of cigarettes. Now, we're not talking about the cigarettes, whether that's good or bad. I'm just telling you the story. And uh, when he turned around, there I stood. And it was like all the blood just drained out of his face. And he said, oh, pastor, if I'd have known you was here, I never would have bought these cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And it was that point in time that I realized that so many Christians really don't realize that God's with them. And I said to him, I heard it come right up out of my mouth. As a matter of fact, my ear jumped around to hear what I was saying. I said, well, if you're not embarrassed to buy them uh, in front of God, why would you be embarrassed to buy them in front of me? Mm -hmm. And I began to observe from that point how many people 
uh, conducted their life outside the church like God wasn't with them. Mm -hmm. And so this is the instance we're finding here is that people were going to the temple. They were still going through the routines. And, of course, you can, you can read over in the Old Testament if you had the time uh, where the Israelites, even when they were worshiping false gods, were still going to the tabernacle and the temple and offering sacrifices. They were doing their religious routine, and God would say, those offerings, those sacrifices are a stench in my nostril. And they'd look at him and say, well, this is what you ask. And he'd say, your outward actions are right, but your heart is far from me. Mm -hmm. and, and we have Christians today that go through the motions of church, but their, their heart is not towards God. They're just going through a religious routine. And this, this is what Jesus was addressing. And so he says, you need, to, uh, you need to recognize that God still requires us to live a holy life. And two-thirds of Paul's writings are telling us that this is what God requires. Now, look at this over in Psalm 24. And it simply says this in verse 3 and 4, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? And then here's who will do it. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord. So we need to... We need to recognize that God still wants us to live a holy life. And, and, you know, we could go through a ton of scriptures, but we're getting close on time here. So I just want you to know that Paul wrote and said, Come you out and be you separate and touch not the unclean thing. So here we, we see that God wants the purity to come back, the holiness to come back into this temple. Mm -hmm. And that we should live a holy life. And now, then... Uh, that's just, like I say, we could read a lot of scriptures, but for the sake of time. But now, people get confused here. How do you come clean? Well, let me read you this scripture, because I don't want anybody to get confused. And, and thank you. Listen to this in John 15, beginning with verse 1. Jesus is speaking, and he says, I'm the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now here's the scripture, verse 3. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So how do, how do we begin to live a pure, holy life before the Lord? According to the scripture. Mm -hmm. The word will bring the correction. The word will bring the discipline. The word will bring the, the, the cleanness to us. Mm -hmm. All right, and then, then he said it should be a house of prayer. So we should be people of prayer. If, if the temple is supposed to be a house of prayer, well, we're supposed to be a house of prayer. And, and first of all, how do we, well, First John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and, and then uh, pray that God's will be done on earth as being done in heaven. Immediately after we, we, we have ourselves cleansed by the word and then we become people of prayer, then God says power is going to be manifested. And you can go to the book of Acts and see they separated themselves in the, in the upper room, Acts chapter 1 and 2. Uh, the disciples obeying the Lord, they separate themselves. They were in the house, of, uh, uh, upper room. They were praying 10 days. And then all of a sudden, Power came. The Holy Ghost came. And then, then you read that immediately after that, they were praising God, and God was adding to the church daily. He said, you should be saved. So we see this principle coming through throughout Scripture, uh, that, that power comes when God's presence is manifested. It's manifested when we're, we're, we're living a holy life, and we're living a life of prayer, and then immediately follows that is our praise. So you and I, each one of us have to come to that place where we commit ourselves to live a holy life, a pure life, and a life of prayer, a life of praise, and we'll see the power of God manifested. Amen. <laughs> Talking as fast as I could. Right. <laughs> I know. That, that's, that's a lot of meat in there, though. It is a lot of stuff that, that could be expanded on and, and uh, amplified on, and, but I think it's the message we need to be hearing. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, we have a lot of really good questions here. So the first one I'll start with 
uh, from Karen on YouTube is asking, how can we encourage our churches to be more Holy Spirit led? So I'm assuming this is not the pastor of the church, but for, for the members of the church. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that God works in a chain of command. And I think whoever is in charge of that, usually it's the pastor that's, uh, that's leading the service. Uh, first of all, the pastor needs to be sensitive to the movement of the Spirit and, and uh, make room and, and allow the Spirit to move. Uh, it, it, uh, Paul writes uh, another scripture that comes in there, everything must be done decently in order. So if the pastor is not leading in that direction, you'd be totally out of order if you try to orchestrate it. So just pray for your pastor or whoever's leading that service that they would be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Awesome. Yeah, that can be a tricky one. Yeah. I know there's another one. Let me find, um, let's see, a very similar one. Yeah, Malcolm on Facebook was asking, how do you, what do you do when there are no churches around you that teach the truth, um, and yet the importance of community is drummed into us? Do we endure wrong Bible teaching just to be part of a community? Uh, if, I, if I had the answer to that, I'd be in great demand all over the world. Uh, I'm giving I, you all the easy ones first. I really don't know how to answer that question, but... Uh, uh, pray for certain, uh, and there are there are there are churches that teach the truth, mm. and and uh, certainly that's not that's not a bad thing to go sit under the word if it's being taught the word of God. Uh, so it's not going to do you any harm to sit under somebody preaching the word, but it would be nice if uh, we would begin to recognize. Uh, I, I I guess I need to say this, uh, Daniel. Jesus himself made the statement, the son of his own self can do nothing. It's the father in me that does the work. And, of course, the father was in him by the spirit. And then he went on to testify, I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father. So Jesus is saying that in his earthly ministry, he was totally dependent on the direction of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Paul writes in Romans that they that are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. And so... From Old Testament to New Testament, it's emphasized how we should be dependent mm -hmm. on the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know that we emphasize that enough. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So um, on the personal side, so Mandy on chat is asking, is there a way to usher in the Holy Spirit in our daily lives in a more tangible way? Sometimes you walk into a church. Five days a week, we've varied the times so that we can accommodate anybody's schedule and it's going to really be good. We're going to use our instructors from the school, and it'll be a blessing. So remember, we now have a Karis Daily Live Bible Study, five days a week. My name is Rick Renner. This is February 18th. And our gem today is called God's Guarantee. And the scripture is James 1.5 which says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally. We're going to focus on that word liberally. Some people think that God will answer them, but God will never tell them everything, that God will always hold out a little of information from them. But that's not what James says. James says, if you'll come alongside of God, if you'll get right alongside the heart of God, God will open his hand and show you everything you need to know. In fact, he says, God will answer you liberally. Listen to what the word liberally means. It means something that is bountiful. It describes something generous, lavish, liberal, plentiful, or something that is rich. In this verse, we find that God has an open hand opposed to someone who keeps a closed fist. So if we will fulfill the requirement to come alongside of God, come alongside of God, give him our heart, give him our attention, God will open his hand and he will generously plentifully answer us with the wisdom and the information that we need. That's God's guarantee in James 1.5. That's what I want you to think about today. God has brought us here to change all of us. Every person here, this is one of the major things you're looking for is change in your life. Changing growing, experiencing the supernatural testimonies of God within your life. 
Paris has made an enormous impact to me. It has opened up doors that I could have never have opened myself. All of those dreams and desires that you've had in your heart, and you can learn how to step out of Karis Bible College and immediately begin your vision or your business or whatever it is you want to do. At this point, and it's only been two years, I can't imagine going through life without this anymore. The greatest thing you will ever do is renew your mind by the Word of God. You're going to get laser focused on your purpose and on your gifts and on your calling, and you're going to go out and change the world. Amen? You can determine your destiny. Hey, friends. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's Karis Talks. Stay tuned for my friend Teresa and her awesome story about how she's come to Karis and all the experiences that she's had since she's been here. Hey friends, thank you so much for tuning in to today's Karis Talks. I've got my friend Teresa Wonder here today. What's, What's up? up, everyone? I'm so, so excited to have you here today <laughs> Thank on you. the show. First question is, where are you from? I'm from Austria, which is in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> That's Just awesome. It's, that is good. Uh, beautiful, small, well, kind of small town, like mm -hmm. 50,000 people in the south. So. Mm. So what year are you right now? I'm a third year student third in year ministry student. school awesome. and the evangelism elective. So, yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about the evangelism elective. What's, what have you gotten out of that? Um, so I used to be selfish, you know. <laughs> um, I used to, like, I would have never gone out to evangelize or anything like that. I knew that I should do it, mm -hmm. but I was just, I just felt like I couldn't do it and I didn't have it in me. I didn't have enough um, word or anything mm -hmm. and this year just really pushed me out of my comfort zone yeah. so much we went to mardi gras um, we did you and i yeah, yeah. with the team and that was like way out of my comfort zone mm -hmm. but how amazing like god just really um used us and then i also went to las vegas mm -hmm. um over spring break with a, another team and that was really cool too and yeah it's just like stepping out you know stepping out of that comfort zone realizing that God is really using you or me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, just praying for people, seeing them healed. Like, how cool is that? I mean, Jesus says it, you know, but until you really do it and experience it yeah. yourself, it's just a theory. And yeah. It's like you're so. talking with your friends. It's like, hey, we're going to go to church. That's the plan. That's like, okay, I can do that. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to a Bible study. That's the plan. It's like, okay. today we're going to go out on the streets. Whoa. Yeah. Well. No, I'm too scared to do that. Literally, I would have my heart would be yeah. racing. And mm -hmm. um, in Mardi Gras, the very first day, I was super, super scared. But then, after a while, it's like, wow, this is yeah. cool, you know. And Jesus says, um, "It's my food is to do the will of the Father." And literally, it's so energizing when mm -hmm. you do what what God wants you to do. It's fun, you know, yeah. seeing Him use you, and that you really do have everything it takes yeah. and these people need what i have right you know? yeah so yeah that's exciting it's so for awesome. those of y'all that are tuning in we do take a trip in the third year uh to mardi gras down in new orleans uh, down to bourbon street mm -hmm. and there's enough hate in the name of god we go down there with a different right. agenda mm -hmm. that we just really want to love on people and that's kind of the heart behind yeah. and it makes evangelism so much easier yeah. when we just go to to love on people and just say, hey, you know, are you sick? Let's pray for you. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to get back on track and ask you this question. How did you hear about Karis Bible College, being from Austria, which is in Europe? <laughs> Good job. <Yeah. laughs> so um, Andrew Womack, our president and founder yeah. here, is um, on God TV in Austria, mm. or I guess in, in all of Europe, but in Austria. And so my mother used to watch him. Yeah. I think I was about maybe 16 or 17 years old. So um, I became a nanny here in Georgia in the States. Mm -hmm. And my pastor from Austria told me to listen to Andrew Womack. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, I think I'm going to give it a try. And um, that was in August of 2014. And I ended up listening to Andrew Womack almost every single day. And so the change mm -hmm. in my heart, you know, that that's when it basically started. But he must have mentioned Karis Bible College sure. at some point, mm -hmm. probably. And so in October of 2014, I started listening to the worship here. That's every Monday and Wednesday. Yeah. And I just loved it. And so it was really cool. I came here and I just wanted to visit. Mm -hmm. um, 
and because I was like, well, I might as well go to a conference with Andrew Womack since sure. I've been listening to him just for be so exposed long. To yeah, like... just just to see. And I signed up the second day that I was here, <laughs> <laughs> and I did not. Li I, I really didn't plan on it. I didn't yeah. want to go to Bible college. I didn't think I needed to mm, go to Bible yeah. college. I thought I was fine, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, so God started I, kind of speaking to you. And yeah, saying, yeah. Hey, uh, and Andrew said, "Teresa, this is for you." Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. he said, "Just take a step of faith." And as soon as you take a step of faith, God is just going to bring the things to pass that he tells mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And so even though it seemed impossible, I just did it, you know, and, and God, I mean, it's just been amazing how he's provided and the friends that I've found and especially the relationship with, with him. Yeah, so. that's exciting. Yeah. What's the, um, the biggest revelation you think you've gotten since you've been here? Um, probably that I'm a new creation. What does that mean? So it means that when I'm when I got born again, when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, my spirit became new, <clears throat> you know, like all the, the old sin and and everything that I used to do, that's not the real me. I'm the righteousness of God. I'm right with God. Yeah. You know, I am forgiven of my sins. Uh -huh. um, and I didn't real. I mean, I, I kind of knew because I was a Christian from when I was five or six years old, but I never lived in it. Mm. Yeah, because I just didn't, it wasn't a revelation until yeah. I came here. And so now I know, you know, I don't have to live in the whole up and down with God. Like two days are awesome with God and mm -hmm. I'm just really like spending time with him. And then it's like a week of depression or something, mm -hmm. you know. And so um, it's just a constant thing now because I know who I am and I know who God is. Mm. And so... Yeah. When you said new cre new creation, would you say it's like a fresh start? Would that be a good way of... Um, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. Yeah, you know. I, th I think so, yeah. Like, where I know now, okay, I'm not, I'm not the old person anymore that I used to be. Mm -hmm. Like, I used to, I don't know, I used to get mad. I, and maybe people don't know that or whatever, because <laughs> I'm always pretty happy. But that's the Lord, you know? Yeah. Um, or I used to be shy. I didn't want to talk to people. And now God is just transforming me into wanting to share him with people even you know and in, yeah. in, in europe that's not normal like right. you don't we don't do that yeah. <laughs> we don't share what we believe god forbid yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah so i think that's that's good that's so good. if there was any question that you want to be asked in this interview what's the question and then what's the answer <laughs> let's see if i can get that <laughs> so um what did you used to say is that, a, is that correct? What did you used to what say? What did you used to say, but it wasn't real to you? What did you used to say, but it wasn't real to you? <laughs> so I used to say that I love Jesus, but it really wasn't real to me mm. until, so, um, you know, when people say, go back to your first love, like you've left, you've left your first love with Jesus. Um, you need to go back and, and really kindle this love again, yeah. but since I got born again when I was really young, I don't think I ever had this radical experience with God where it's like, you know, I just came out of drugs and he just overwhelmed me sure. with this love and I just got completely changed because it was just kind of normal. And so, yeah, I felt like I knew God. I felt like I was doing stuff for him, but I never really knew him in that way, you yeah. know? And so coming to Karis and, and really just fairly recently, um, over third year, which is why I'm so glad that I did three years, you know, mm -hmm. not yeah. just one or two. Um, <clears throat> God just really, I don't know, it, it just became real to me. And now I can say with all my heart that I do love Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And this is my life. Like, it's not my parents' faith anymore. Right. It's not okay. anything that I used to do or that's just a tradition. No, mm -hmm. like, this is my life now. because, mm -hmm. And I want to serve Him because I love Him. So It's a real tangible yeah. experience things you've yeah had. it's the best so teresa <laughs> somebody's watching this right now uh -huh. and you know what would you tell them you know why is why is karis a good option for them i know god's probably gonna you know do his part and say hey you should go to karis mm -hmm. but what would you tell somebody that's watching right now yeah um, so i didn't know that i needed this <laughs> <laughs> i i really i thought i was fine you know i went to church and i was born again from when i was like five or six years old uh, i even served on my worship team in church and everything but 
God wasn't real to me. And so coming to Karis made him real to me. Mm. I now have a relationship with God. And if that's what you're looking for, then this is the place to be. I mean, what better to sit under God's word for four hours every day for one or two or three years? And I would suggest three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Because, yeah, and I mean, you're just going to be changed. And change is going to happen in areas that you didn't even know you needed change. So if God is telling you and, you know, if you think you should come, then totally come. Just do it. <laughs> Just yeah, do just it. do it. Exactly. <laughs> and God is so going to provide for you if you have fear or whatever. I have not seen the righteous beg for bread yet, and I won't. <laughs> and you won't either. So That's awesome, yeah. Teresa. Thank you so much for being on Care Stars today. Thanks for having me. And uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in to today's Care's Talks. Thanks for watching this episode of Karis Talks. To learn more about Karis Bible College, visit our website today. Hey friends, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of today's Karis Talks. Is God speaking to you? Are you wanting more information about Karis Bible College? Click this link below, get a little more information. Also, if you've enjoyed this testimony, like, share, and subscribe to this channel to hear more awesome stories of what God's doing here and Karis Bible College. Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you're watching our Gospel Truth TV. I tell you, this has been a blessing. You know, if you are being touched by these programmers that we have on here, I would encourage you to support them. Did you know we don't charge any of the programmers? If you appreciate that, I encourage you to be a part of it. Join us, support Gospel Truth TV, and also support the program. What a blessing. All right, well, we're about ready to have J.B. come up, James Brown. You can make your way since it takes a little ways to get up here, but... What an honor. I am just so blessed, and I know that I'm saying this for all of the men that are here, that Coach uh, Tony and JB, what an honor to have them come and just give of themselves. And I've talked to them, and they love this because they really do have a heart for the Lord, and it's just such an honor to have them here sharing with us. We've got Mayor Levy here with us today. Mayor of Woodland Park, stand up. Mayor, this is our mayor. Appreciate him being with us. And he has set it up. He uh, is one that instigated uh, Tony speaking in the Woodland Park schools this afternoon. So, man, we are excited about that, believing the great things are going to happen. But this is James Brown. I tell you, I love this man. He and his wife. I bet you Dorothy's probably watching right now. But I tell you what, what a great couple they are, and they love the Lord, and God is using them in great ways. So, brother, we want to hear what God's got for you to share with us. Thank God you so bless much. you. Let's welcome James Brown. Good morning, everyone. But first of all, can I say thank you so very much for having me back here at the uh, men's events here at Karis Bible College. Uh, this is awesome to use Andrew's word. I can't say it quite like Andrew. Hey, let me ask you, please, be involved with me. Uh, Tony is the cerebral, substantive, quiet, articulate lecturer. Your boy's a little loud, okay? So just bear with me. Don't hold that against me. Tony is the um, Bible study leader that we have, we do a Bible study every Wednesday, and it started with three people in New York City with Bellman, uh, messengers, room service people coming up to Tony's room and to my room, and that was about seven or eight years ago, and it's now like church membership. We probably have a membership of about 100 plus from around the country with a guard, good hard 50 who show up every week as Tony walks us through the lessons, and he's a marvelous teacher. So uh, I'm very blessed, but I'm thankful to be back here because As Billy Epperhart was talking about the awesome ministry that this is, that my wife 
brought me to many years ago on television, waking up to this gentleman from Texas <laughs> every morning preaching the unadulterated word of God. And to be blessed to be a part of this is beyond my wildest dreams. But he has, to Paul's point and to Billy's point, he has a ministerial staff here that is flat out the best that I have encountered in being blessed to travel around the world. People who have his back biblically, and they are awesome. You, clearly, you've, uh, you've seen the CEO, Paul Milligan, and Billy Epperhart, who understand from God's kingdom principles how to contribute mightily to the upbuilding of the kingdom. But I've also been blessed to meet Barry Bennett and uh, Pastor Greg Moore. Uh, and others and really tap into them and they've helped me to equip me to go out and speak in secular settings but with biblical underpinnings with everything I do. So I want to personally thank them so very much for pouring into me as well. Now the other thing I want to say, I know a lot of you guys really persevered to get here through some difficulties. I've got some friends from Washington DC, Reverend Alan Tillman and guys, and they went through a number of difficulties to get here. But as Tony Dungy was saying, God has a blessing in store for you here today. Part of my challenge in thinking through what I was going to talk about, especially after listening to Tony, and Tony does a really nice job of kind of encouraging you, which is what he did as a coach. He doesn't berate you. He never engaged in profanity-laced tirades to encourage his team. And of course, they went on to win the Super Bowl. But look at how subtle he was this morning. I had no idea that he was trying to let me know that I've got to get back on the straight and narrow because he puts up a photo of a half-eaten chocolate cake. And I'm like, well, well, what's the message here? Now, we know that Paul Milligan has lost 70 pounds. And what Tony was saying, in essence, is I was going behind Paul Milligan, picking up those pounds, and have put them on since. And yeah, I did lose a lot of weight. I was back, almost back to high school weight of about 195 pounds about two years ago. And today, I'm knocking in about 275 pounds right now. So, <laughs> so I, I am going to work on that. And that was Tony's uh, subtle way of doing that. And I was thinking, well, how am I going to set this message up uh, for this morning? As Lieutenant um, Ryan Haley from the CBC, a third year student, was telling me, JB, you are a contributor, consistent with what is said in Ephesians 4.16, every joint supplies. Andrew started on Philippians 3. We never got there last night <laughs> because Andrew's got so much written on the tablet of his heart. But Philippians 3.10 has been my mantra for the year. And we know that's where the Apostle Paul, who was talking about all of his worldly accomplishments, if you will, and the feathers in his cap being a Pharisee of Pharisees, uh, zealous for pursuing, uh, persecuting the Christian church and the whole nine yards. But once he had an encounter with Jesus Christ, he said he counted all of that loss, but for the excellency of Jesus Christ, he counted it all as dung. And I love 3 and 10, which says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto death that I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead as well. That's my focus. So I was asking the Lord, well, why this message here? And I didn't know how to set it up. But in talking with Billy Epperhart this morning at breakfast, I was sharing with him how in the secular world, I'm blessed to also be a special correspondent for CBS News. So I get to contribute to all of the platforms, some 60 Minutes, Evening News, you name it. And two years ago, I was thrilled when Marilyn Hickey was seeking which network might cover her on her trip to Pakistan. Well, my CBS News producer, Alvin Patrick, is also a Christian, and we were blessed to talk with her ministry and get the opportunity to follow her over to Pakistan. Now, my boss, the chairman of CBS Sports, says, JB, you can do anything in news. Just talk to me if you're doing something that's controversial or that might be dangerous. Just let me know so I'm aware of this. So here we get the opportunity to travel to Pakistan. The State Department has a warning for all Westerners traveling to Pakistan and especially Western journalists going to Pakistan. So we get over to Pakistan following Marilyn Hickey, who is, has unbelievable energy at 87 years of age. Her mission is to cover the earth with the word. And then they mentioned that they wanted me to do a stand-up with a microphone. I'm walking in downtown Pakistan, 
and I'm looking around and I've got, take a look at this photo, I got seven armed gunmen surrounding me in downtown Lahore, Pakistan. And what came into my head was Harrison Ford in Patriot Games with folks up on top of the buildings. And then I remembered the warning about Western travelers over to um, Pakistan. And I remembered I hadn't called my boss. <laughs> and the warning was especially against Western journalists. But well, don't you think that I was the biggest Negro in Pakistan walking downtown? <laughs> and I got these guys. So what did I do? Like any good Christian, I prayed in the name of? Jesus. In the name of? Jesus. Thank you. So as Tony talked about walking along that narrow road, my overarching message this morning is to make certain that we understand the name of who it is we serve, the name of who protects us. Marilyn Hickey has been protected because when I interviewed her for that one hour special on CBS, not three minutes, not 14 minutes, but an hour program, she said that she went over to Pakistan several years ago, talked to over 750,000 people. But the security force said there were 32 suicide bombers whose express aim was to take her out and the folks who were at that gathering. And I asked, I said, well, what happened? She said, JB, they caught 17 of them. I said, well, 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 Dr. Hickey, what about the other 15? She said, God's got my back. <laughs> it's the name that provides the protection. So for all of us men, and as Andrew was saying last night, let's be transparent. All of us have got some challenges. Make no mistake about it. But the question is, who are we following? Whose word are we listening to? What philosophy are we standing on? That which is proven to be the most effective. And there's only one name that matters. So I prayed in the name and that's what set me up here. So my message today starts with the scripture in Exodus chapter 3 verses 13 through 15. Exodus 3, 13 through 15. And I operate with the King James Version. So if they can put that up on the screen, here is my foundational scripture. And we all know it, but bear with me as I set the foundation for the message. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come into the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. John 6, 35 reads, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. John 9 and 5 says, I am the light of the world. John 10 and 9 says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And John 10 and 11 says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd giveth his life for me. So if there's any question about what the topic of my message is this morning, the topic is, I am. I am. You know what? In certain cultures, every name has a meaning. But it seems, and this is probably more anecdotal, I haven't done a comprehensive survey on this, but it seems that most of us in America today name our children simply a name by way of designating who that child is, a way of differentiating that child from somebody else without really giving an awful lot of thought, a means of identification, if you, may, if you will. They may often, we may often, name a child about for someone we respected in the family, or the names could be those that are very popular and in style today, but we seldom research the meaning of a name, which is so significant, and oftentimes we might even think that the name really doesn't have any meaning in and of itself. But what really is surprising to me, and I had my niece, Ashley Johnson, do a little research to see some of the crazy, outrageous names 
that people name their kids. For instance, if we have it up on the board, there's one family whose last name is Open, O-P-P-I-N, and they went on and named their daughter Normally, Normally Open. There was another family whose last name was Q, C-U-E. They named their daughter Barbie, Barbecue. There was another family, interesting, whose last name was Aki, A-K-I. They named their son Terry, Terry Aki. And then Trey, you think about this, there was one family whose last name is Hogg, H-O-G-G. They had the nerve to name their daughter Ima. I'm a hog. Or a family whose last name was Nut, and they named their daughter, I'm a Nut. Names from the sublime to the ridiculous. And certain names, as we know, fall into disrepute because of the behavior of the person. Judas is an example of that. Of course, as a traitor. Jezebel, a woman of loose morals and no modesty. We don't name our children those names because the behavior of the person defined that name. But you know what? For the most part in today's society, names are meaningless. But I know in certain parts of the world, as a matter of fact, Marilyn Hickey's um, television crew, there was a young man from Russia whose name was Ruven, which means like my son or the son of God. But in African countries, and Tony and I can tell you with a number of African athletes, they are excited to share with you what their name means because those names mean something and it represents the purpose and the direction that that family has for raising that child. As a matter of fact, at the medical building where I go for my physical, don't comment on my gut, okay? Where I go for my physical, there's a woman there, an African woman, whose name is self-explanatory. Her first name is Blessed. But then there are others who will name their children we know in biblical times, every name had a meaning. Biblical names were descriptive and prophetic. The name Samuel means heard of God. The name Adonoma means Yahweh is my Lord. And for you men, before you head back home, get to understand what your wife's name means. My wife's name is Dorothy and she reminds me that it means gift of God. You'll win some brownie points if you do that. So that was the case in many of those cultures because they knew that. It reminds them of who they are and it reminds them of what their purpose in life is meant to be. So that's the foundation with respect to names and the significance of those names. Now let me just paraphrase this. We all know the story of Moses who was born of Hebrew slaves in Egypt. He was adopted and raised by the daughter of the Pharaoh in the palace of the Pharaoh. And when Moses grew older, we know that he got into a dispute and he killed an Egyptian, had to flee from Egypt. And he made his home in a wilderness place called Midian. And he lived with the priest there who had many daughters. The priest's name was Jethro. And the Bible lets us know they were of Egyptian descent, if you will. And his wife, who he married one of those daughters, was a dark-skinned woman, Zipporah. But it was this Moses that God chose to lead Israel out of slavery. God initiated the call of Moses to his mission by attracting him to a bush that was burning. But that bush was not reduced to ashes. It was not consumed. There was no fuel there for that bush to burn. Fire, light, power, all of that existed in this bush without consuming it because it was self-generating energy. It was energy from an independent source. And all of this is foundational to get to this point. So Moses said, well, let me check this bush out. And as he came closer, God spoke to him and identified himself as a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God informed Moses that he had been chosen to lead Israel out of captivity and into the promised land. And he was directed to go to Pharaoh to tell him to let God's people go and was to also lead them out of captivity. But having been raised in the palace of the Pharaoh, Moses knew 
that the Egyptian people were very religious people because they worshiped a number of gods. They worshiped the sun god, whose name was Ra, R-A, the moon god, whose name was Kunsu, K-H-U-N-S-U. But you know what? At one point during their history, they worshiped a whole host of animal gods. As a matter of fact, during certain parts of their history, they worshiped the bull, the crocodile, the goat, the cow, the goose, the ram, the cat, the dog, the chicken, the jackal, the serpent. They worshiped trees and plants and rivers, among other things. So Moses knew that Pharaoh and the children of Israel ask, what God are you talking about? Because all of their gods represented something you could see and touch. So when Moses was commanded to go and tell Pharaoh that, he knew that he had to have a name. He said, God, what is your name? And in Exodus 3 and 14, as we read it, God said, I am that I am. And this you shall say to the children of Israel, that I am hath sent you. Well, I'm certainly not a theologian. I'm learning from this ministerial staff of Andrews as I dig deeper and growing deeper into the word. Because it's interesting, the more you read the word, the more you see in it, the more you see in it, the more you see in it. That's progressive revelation. So Moses knew that he had to go and give them a name. But it seemed that there was never another time in the Bible when, go, God, when Moses mentioned the name I am, at least in the King James Version of the Old Testament. It's only here in Exodus 3 and 14. This is the only place that it's used, and it's the only place that is named. So why would God give Moses a name and Moses never used that name that God gave him again. One would think that that name would be on every page of the Bible and on the lips of every man and woman of God. But as I grew deeper in understanding the word, the fact of the matter is that name is on every page in the Bible. And it is on the lips of every man and woman in the Bible. Because the word God used was the Hebrew word in verse 14, which is Chaya, which means I am. And Chaya is the root word that God used in verse 15, which is Yahweh or Jehovah. Yahweh means the self-existent one, the eternal one. It means I am that I am. And so the Hebrew word that's translated in verse 15, Lord, we notice in our Bibles that word is all capital letters. Not a capital letter followed by lowercase letters, but all capital letters. That is in place of what in the Greek is called the tetragrammaton. Four consonants, Y-H-W-H or J-H. W H because in the Hebrew, of course, it used only consonants, not vowels. The tetragrammaton, which is Greek for four letters. And so wherever the name Yahweh was to be mentioned or Jehovah was to be mentioned, they would place the tetragrammaton there instead. And the tetragrammaton would say Yahweh. But as time went on, the Jews actually stopped even mentioning the name of Yahweh because they thought it was too high and too holy to even mention. So whenever they saw the Tetragrammaton or Yahweh, they would speak the word Adonai or Lord instead. We all know that the word Elohim means God. They use it to demonstrate the universal sovereignty of the living God over other so-called little gods. So wherever we see the word Lord in all capital letters, we should know that the early Hebrew text said Yahweh. And it's found in the Old Testament more than 6,000 times as Lord 6,515 times in our Bibles and as God four times, Jehovah or Yahweh four times. Last piece of information, scholars tell us that the words I am or Yahweh means that God is personal, God is infinite, God is original, God is always present and that he's always with us, that he is the self-existent one. He is the eternal one. It indicates the idea that's expressed by the name Yahweh uh, is that of real perfect, unconditional, independent existence. The name Yahweh signals the truth that absolutely nothing else defines 
who God is, but God himself. God is the only one who can define himself. What God says and what God does is exactly who God is. God says, I am who I am. I bring into existence whatever I want to bring into existence. Yahweh indicates through all eternity, I am. And I am the creator of all that was and all that is and all that will ever be. I'm always present. I'm always powerful. And I don't need anything else to define or sustain my existence. Just like that fire that was burning in the bush. It didn't need the material of that bush to burn. It burned without consuming the bush. And God always says, I don't need anything else to define who I am I am just who I am. So when God says my name is I am, God was saying that my name is Yahweh. And the reason that that is so important, because as we get over into the New Testament, in the book of John, he begins to talk about who Jesus is and what his goal is and what his objective is. We know that in John 20, 30 through 31, it says this, many of the signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. John says, I want you to believe that Jesus is the son of God. And in John one and one through five and 12 and 14, we know what it says. Jesus gives us, in essence, a summary of the nature and the role of Jesus when he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word the same was in the beginning. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. But as many received him, to them gave he power to be the sons of God, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Listen, Jesus performed many miracles, but John only records eight of those miracles and each of those miracles represents an aspect of the divine power that was possessed by Jesus and in between the miracles is the narrative of John but also the words of Jesus Christ and listen to what Jesus said because centuries after Moses heard the voice of God and centuries after the Old Testament had been written and centuries after the Jews stopped even pronouncing his name, my goodness, here comes Jesus Christ saying in John 6.35, I am the bread of life. And in John 8.23, I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. In John 9.5, he says, I am the light of the world. In John 7.29, he said, but I know him for I am from him and he hath sent me. In John 10, 36, he said, I am the son of God. In John 15 and one, he says, I am the true vine. So Jesus came on the scene saying, I am, I am, and I am. So in this Jesus, the I am that was spoken to Moses was restored in that New Testament day. And the name that they had been using for centuries, not using for centuries, where here comes Jesus Christ stating authoritatively and definitively, I am. So let me observe just two things and wrap this message up. A few applications for us today, having laid that foundation. So the question is, what does that mean for us now? Understanding as well now, what the name I am means. Might it just be that when Yahweh first appeared to Moses, he appeared in a bush that was burning, but was not consumed. 
Is it fair to extrapolate from there and think that the first thing that we ought to claim with the reinstitution of this I am or Yahweh is to let us know that no matter what difficulties we go through in life that might normally burn us up or destroy us or consume us or we think is going to consume us, they are not going to burn us up. They are not going to take us out. Stuff that other people would cause them to lose their mind. Stuff that would cause other people to give up. Stuff that would cause other people to wave the white flag of surrender. That would cause a lot of people to walk away and surrender everything because they're not focused on who they belong to, who they are. They will be able to keep on walking. We will be able to keep on walking right in the midst of whatever that fiery trial or tribulation is and it won't burn us up. Because if the very introduction of our God was by a bush that was on fire but not being burned up, then that should let us know that the trial or the tribulation or the difficulty that we're going through will not take us out. That's the interpretation for today. And the Bible is not a book of fairy tales. The Bible is full of actions and activities and experiences that actually occurred. Biblical historians are as detailed as they come. Let's be rooted in our faith and not have anybody take us off track because they're saying, how can you believe that? Because it occurred. Fire won't take us out. Don't you think that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have something to say about that to us today because of what they went through? They would not bow down to the image that the king set up. They said, King, whatever you're going to do, go ahead and do it. But we are not bowing down to the image that you put up. How many of us today in the world, in secular society, have idols in effect? Because we worship money, we worship fame, we worship positions and influence. That is an idol. These three Hebrew boys showed us today what we ought to be about and that is to stand because it will not burn us up and take us out. And we know the story. The king, when he found out that they disregarded what his mandate was, he had them thrown into the fire. The fire heated up seven times thrown in there. The king had them bound, tied up and thrown in. Well, when he came back a little later, you know the story, he looked in and talked to his boys and said, wait a minute, didn't we throw three men into the fire, bound up and tied? And they said, yes, king, we absolutely did. He said, well, why am I seeing four men in the fire walking around and they have no hurt about them? That fire did not need those Hebrew boys to kindle them at all because it did not consume them. The only thing that that fire did, which is helpful for us today in terms of a difficulty that we're going through, thinking that we're bound and tied up, the only thing that fire did was to burn the ropes that was on their hands, burn the ropes that was on their feet, did not burn their hair or turban, did not singe them, didn't singe their clothes at all. And child of God, we will go through things, but we need to put our faith and trust in God. Look at the head of this ministry says that he couldn't even come up with because he had a misreading of what he was supposed to do in the ministry. Couldn't come up with $600 to get his own child out delivered by by Jamie but when he realized he had the wrong thinking he stood on the word of God and what did God do I know Andrew had my wife and I talked with him six or some odd months ago you know what I don't mess with Andrew because Andrew is radical he believes everything that's in the word of God and we're sitting up there having a conversation Dorothy and I and, you know, it was just kind of a natural conversation. And I'm looking at everything that's going on, $75 million debt free. Property over there. They're going to, Billy talks about worldwide, they will be. And I looked at Andrew just marveling, but he won't deviate from the word of God. I said, Andrew, could you imagine this? You could not have imagined this. And he looked at me dead straight and said, yes, I did. Remember when, they, when the Roman soldiers came to get Jesus and they asked, who was Jesus? And he says, I am he. And they fell back. 
When Andrew said, yes, I did, blew me back. I looked at him and said, I'm not messing with this brother, man. Let's just stay on point here, you know. <laughs> so we will be able to function in the midst of a fire. Now, the king said to bring those men out of there. You've heard this before. He brought three men out of the fire. But if there were four men in the fire, why did he only bring three out? Doesn't it make sense that he would have asked for all four? Because he said that fourth one looked like the son of God. Might it be that the fourth one stayed in the fire? The great I am stayed in the fire as an indication to us that when we come into the difficulty, when we get thrown into the fire, when we deal with the difficulty, he's already there. Didn't he tell us in Deuteronomy 31 and 6 and also in Hebrew 13 and 5, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm always a present help in the time of need. That is our God who according to Numbers 23 and 19 said, I'm not a man that I should lie, nor the son of man that I should repent. Galatians 6 and 6 and 7 says, God is not mocked. I'm not messing with Andrew. I'm not messing with God. What God says, he delivers. That's the God that we stand on all day long. He's already in the difficulty when we come there. Let me make just one more observation. Not only is God able to keep us, not only is God able to bring us out of the difficulty, but God, as seen through the lens of Jesus Christ, who is the great I am, the God of the Old Testament. And I was discussing with Minister Paul Milligan. I know we have a notion of thinking that the God of the Old Testament was a God of terror and vengeance. And yes, he did render judgment, but that's not true. Our God always has been consistent as a God of love because he gave the Israelites chance after chance after chance after chance because he loved them. Even when he sent the prophets, whether it was Jeremiah, Ezekiel, everybody trying to warn them, he gave them ample opportunity. So we may think that the Old Testament God was a God of terror and vengeance, but he wasn't. But for the sake of the story, okay, some may have seen him as a God of terror and vengeance. Moses, of course, some people will see he couldn't even come near the burning bush without God saying, take off your shoes because the ground you stand on is holy ground. But in applying the name I am to himself, under this new covenant dispensation, Jesus was letting us know he's not just another man. He's not just another preacher. He's not just another prophet, but he is a divine being. And because of him, we can come now boldly all the way to the throne of grace to receive mercy and grace from Jesus Christ, because that is how God is looking at us right now. Just as he was then back in the burning bush, Jesus was there with Moses then. He is the same I am today. And you know what? If it doesn't exist, Jesus can speak to it and make it happen. But he's given us that power as he is, so are we. We can speak to something if it doesn't exist and make it happen. Andrew spoke to that last night. If we don't have food, if we run out of material goods, if we have need of something, well, if he fed the 5,000, that was just men, he can sure enough feed us. But he also said that he is one who will feed us spiritually. For Jesus said, if we get him, we will never hunger, nor will we thirst. Let me just make the point about some of you. I've heard some of the stories. People saying, you know what? You have no idea what I'm going through. I'm down to nothing. I have absolutely nothing right now. But don't you know who it is that you serve? Even if you look at it in a natural, Jesus Christ, how was the world formed? If you look up in the sky at nighttime, you see a bunch of nothing. Well, our God, Jesus, stepped out of nothing 
on to nothing because there was nothing for him to stand on. And he spoke to nothing because there was nothing for him to speak to. And he said, let there be. And when he said that, worlds were formed, planets were formed, sun was formed, moon was formed, water started flowing here, birds started flying, trees started growing down here. Don't you know if you're down to nothing, our God works with nothing very, very well. Hallelujah. That's the kind of God that we serve. Don't let anybody tell you it's common. Coach Dungey has driven this point home. There's no such thing as new fundamentals. Fundamentals are tried and true throughout. Same thing with the word of God. Many of us have itching ears to go hear something new. The Bible says it ain't nothing new under the sun. God's word was true then. It is true now. It will stand. Don't roll the dice with your life and play around. God says he is God and he is the one who can deliver. Don't let anybody tell you that there are a number of ways to go to God the Father. Jesus made it clear when he said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and be able to go in and out and find pasture. Like that beautiful picture that Tony showed of us being planted by rivers of water. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming to the Father but by me. You can't get there through Confucius. You can't get there through Buddha. You can't get there by any other name but the name of Jesus Christ. Why is it that in the secular world, in our business, you can talk and interview somebody, they can mention whatever philosophy they stand on, whatever God they serve, but let somebody mention the name of Jesus. Tony Dungy. Hallelujah. When he, we thought Tony was going to have a job many years ago. Thought he had the job until he met with one owner who said, how are you going to motivate these men? Tony said, I'm going to treat them like men. I'll be able to get them to perform. The guy said, you mean to tell me that you're not going to curse at these guys? Tony says, I don't need to do that. The owner said, you will never make it as an NFL coach. Tony didn't get the job. I don't know exactly how long it was. I believe it was two years before he got the job. But you know what he did in the interim? He took the time to study leadership. Not from some of the best business leaders we know. Make no mistake about it. He and his team chaplain studied the book of Nehemiah. Biblical leadership. And when he got his opportunity, turned that Tampa Bay franchise around. Turned them from losers to winners into the postseason. Ownership got antsy, wanted to get to the Super Bowl quicker, fired Tony Dungy. What? <laughs> then they had a press conference to announce his firing. I have never in all my years of covering sports seen a coach go to his own press conference to announce his firing. <laughs> Tony, what's wrong with you? He said, they gave me my first opportunity I wanted to thank them. Is that not Christian behavior? And he also said, and he also said, it was abundantly clear. I hurt. I didn't understand it in the natural, but God had something else in store for me. One week later, he gets a phone call from the, from the coach. The owner said, this is not an interview. All I want to know is, do you want the job? <laughs> Tony said, yes. He went and still implemented the same biblical principles. They interview him time and time again. He talks about the biblical examples that inspired them as a team. But they cut out the name of Jesus when they recorded him until he got to the Super Bowl. Two Christian coaches there. Lovey Smith. Let's not forget him. Tony won the Super Bowl. Hundreds of millions of people watching around the world. Tony's on live TV. Can't cut him off now. My colleague, Jim Nance. Tony, how does it feel to be the first African-American to win the Super Bowl? Gracious Tony. Jim, very nice indeed. First things first. I wanted to prove that we could do it the Lord's way. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's what he did. <clears throat> Yeah.
Let me truncate this. I went off script with that, but that's my mentor. Let me close by this. People did their best to deny Jesus Christ in the Bible, try to deny his divinity, to rationalize his miracles, to engage him and trick him in intellectual traps. The man, the God who created all of us and these Pharisees and others are going to try to trip him in his own word. And upon every cross examination, upon every attempt to try to catch him in a contradiction, Jesus would silence them with the truth. One would think that Jesus' many excellent discourses would have caused those Pharisees to recant and alter their opinion and come to him. But instead, their hearts were hardened even more. Witness, if you will, the story in John 8, 48 through 58, where the Pharisees accused Jesus of having a devil. Jesus remarked, I have not a devil in me, but he honors his father. You honor the wicked one. You dishonor Jesus. Jesus told them that he did not seek his own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Jesus told them, if a man keep my singing, he shall never see death. Hallelujah. The boy that set the Pharisees off. They just knew he had a devil in them. The Abraham and the prophets, they said, are dead. Yet you claim if a man keep your saying, he will never see death. Jesus told them because he can't lie. Your father Abraham rejoiced when he saw my day and he saw it and he was glad. Then the Jew said unto him, you all know it. You aren't 50 years old and you're going to tell us that you've seen Abraham. What did Jesus reply to them? Verily, verily, I say unto you before Abraham was I am that's our God he can't lie that denotes we live in time Jesus lives outside of time Daniel Amstutz said it he's in an everlasting now that's the kind of God that we serve so whatever we're going through all we need to do is put our faith in the great I am because he is eternal. He's of independent existence. His name, all you need to do is put whatever word you want on the other side of I am. I am your joy. I am the amen. I am the shepherd and bishop of your souls. I am the chief cornerstone. I am the amen. I am the word of God. I am the redeemer. I am all that you want because I am. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, when we get back to the lodge, my coach and mentor, I like to consider him as the Apostle Paul, Tony. I like to think I'm Timothy, his spiritual son, but he will sit me down. Okay, JB, good point. If we can just tone it down just a little bit, okay? (laughs) Thank Thank you very much. Okay. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, can we get our prayer team to come down here? I had a number of people come to me this morning who weren't able to be here last night, and they wanted to be filled with the Spirit. And I think there was either two or three that I sent, but there may be others here. Of course, we had students that weren't here last night, but if there's any way we can serve you, these men are here to serve you. And praise God for Coach Dungy and JB. Aren't they a blessing? You know, I spend a lot of time studying the word. I spend a lot of time listening to other preachers. And yet every time I hear them, they challenge me with things that I haven't thought. It shows that they aren't just echoing what somebody else has said. They have a relationship with God and God speaks to them. And man, every one of you, we pray that you have a relationship with the Lord. It's about a personal relationship and we are here to help you any way we can. Have we got any announcements that need to be made? I'm going to turn it back over to Clay. And uh, we've got some things this afternoon. 
Let me just say real quickly, we are a little premature, but our garage back here, we're trying to get a temporary uh, certificate of occupancy today. We've got our instru- inspection coming this afternoon, and if we can pass, we can open up half of the garage. So maybe by tonight, we'll be, you'll be the very first people to ever park in our garage back here. So we're working on it. Welcome to AWM Now, your source for how Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College are making a difference in lives around the world. Lives like little Melker from Sweden. In April of 2020, one-year-old Melker was diagnosed with boat-shaped skull, a condition which causes the head to be elongated and narrow, which can lead to mental retardation. Around this same time, Andrew had decided to start hosting daily live streams, and one particular day, Melker's mother, Marie, happened to tune in and hear a Holy Spirit-inspired word tailor-made for her. It was actually a Pentecostal day, and I felt a prompting in my heart to stay up in the middle of the night here in Sweden uh, to watch him live, and so I did, and uh, heard him speaking about praying in tongues, and how you can ask for an interpretation for yourself. And I decided to try it. And I put my hands over his head, over the area where the fontanel is. And his fontanel was closed at this time. And when I put my hand on his head, I just felt how the fontanel opened. Inspired from Andrew's teachings, Marie prayed in the spirit over different parts of Melker's head, where she literally felt parts of his skull shift into place. After just a week from his diagnosis, Marie brought Melker in for a CT scan, and to the complete shock of the doctors, his skull was perfectly normal. He's very active, lively, running around, climbing around, and talking. He speaks a lot. Charles Online has helped me a lot. It's a fantastic teaching to not accept a diagnosis. Patients usually put the diagnosis like my diagnosis. And I refused to let the boat skull be his diagnosis. Keep expecting your miracle. For God, nothing is impossible. Thank you, friends and partners, for enabling Andrew to hold daily live streams where people like Marie can be equipped to use their authority in Christ and see the miraculous take place. To see Andrew's daily live stream, click on the link below. Um, there. Travis Adams was born again in a drug rehab, but because he didn't have an understanding of grace, he lived his life afraid that God was mad at him. As a result, he found himself repeatedly going back through the same cycle of sin. That is, until he came across the free teachings of Andrew Womack. This is the grace encounter of Travis Adams. I started off with good intentions until I uh, moved into a house with a girl, uh, one of my friends, mutual friends, and we were uh, living together growing marijuana. And uh, laying on my bed, I just got frustrated and said, God, why can't I go to sleep? And the Lord spoke to me and said, Travis, you know what to do. And I said, God, I can't do, I can't do that though. I got, I got a harvest of marijuana coming up in a couple of weeks, you know, and I was looking forward to harvest, harvesting this marijuana and making a lot of money and, and things like that. But then the Lord spoke back to me. I mean, this was on the inside of me, so strong and clear. He said, son, you need to do this right now. And I just got up right off the floor and went and grabbed a few clothes and jumped in my car and moved out of that house the same day. Left everything I owned there except for a few clothes and moved back into the apartment with my mom. Um, I woke up in my mom's apartment and uh, I was just hungry to hear the word. So I was flipping through the channels and I came across Andrew uh, Womack and he was just sitting at his table and speaking and I just recognized, I didn't, I just recognized this is a preacher and so I just stopped and I started listening to him. The truth is God's kind. You know what? God is a good God. God's long suffering with you. God's not ticked off at you. God's not angry. He's not even mad. You know what? God's in a good mood. God likes you. And he just started saying things like, like God is a good God. 
and he's not mad at you, he's not going to kill you. And when he said that, the Holy Spirit just bore witness in me so strong, and I knew, I knew that God was, was speaking to me through Andrew. And I literally fell off my couch onto my knees and while he was saying these things and just wept and wept and I, and I felt the love of God and I was instantly set free. Harris Bible College invites you to expand your vision. He finished his message and Andrew started talking about his Bible college. I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit speak to me so clear and he said, I'm going to take you to that Bible college one day. You're going to go there. I immediately took down the number on the TV, called the ministry, you know, got free tapes because I didn't have any money to give the ministry, so they sent me free, three free tapes. I, I remember looking through the list of all these different teachings, and I was just praying and asking God, I was like, God, what else do I need to get from this ministry? And when my eyes came on spirit, soul, and body, they literally just became alive and jumped off the page. And that came to me. And man, when that got, when I heard that, it kept me from going back into, you know, God being mad at me or no, he's not mad at me or whatever, because it just told me who I was in Christ. So after I got Andrew's teaching in the mail, I just started devouring everything he had. I just kept ordering everything he had. As Travis continued to renew his mind in the Word, he learned how to be more sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit which became apparent when he began to hear a specific scripture repeatedly in his mind. And I didn't even know what it was, but it was, you shall not die, but live and declare the glory of God. And I finally went to my Bible study leader, Steve, and I said, hey, Steve, God has been telling me all year long that I'm not going to die, but live and declare the glory of God. I don't know what that means, but that just keeps happening. And he's, you know, said, well, try to find out, pray about it, ask the Lord what he's trying to tell you. A week later, Travis decided he would visit an old friend from his past, hoping to share his newfound faith. But on my way over to his house, I knew God was speaking to me and telling me not to go over there. I just knew it. I had a, a check in my spirit. Something was not right. And I honestly, unfortunately, kind of reasoned my, in my head and thought, well, God thinks that I'm going to get back into my old drugs and think, I'm not going to do that. Later that night, Travis became the target for a homicide, an attack from the same old friend that the Holy Spirit was warning him from visiting. He came over to my house and knocked me over the head with a crowbar, knocked me out, and then dragged my body back over into this field and laid me down in, in the grass and he continued to beat my head over, over my head with a crowbar and left me in this field to die. Next thing I know, uh, I'm waking up in a hospital three days later. And that man that I had told the week before that uh, something's going to happen to me, but I'm going to live through it, he was there with the doctors. And he looked down at me, this man did, and he said, Travis, he said, do you remember what the Lord told you? And I, he said that I looked up at him with one eye open, and I had all these wires and hoses coming out of me, and, he, and I just, with all of my strength I mustered, I could say, I just said, I shall not die, but live and declare the glory of God. And then he looked over at all the doctors and he said, that man's going to be all right. Twelve days later, Travis walked out of the hospital completely healed, and his attacker was arrested and sentenced to 12 years in prison. Through his local church, God began confirming it was time for him to go to Karis Bible College. Travis packed up his car and moved to Colorado to begin classes in August 2008. Being at Karis was, it was amazing, just the things that God taught me. He really taught me how to live by faith because I didn't have the money to pay for school and next thing I know somebody's paying for my tuition and I don't even know who it is. I went through school and uh, maybe out of my own pocket only paid like two or three hundred dollars out of it. God brought in all the rest of the money. Travis began working in Andrew's phone center as a prayer minister. He also started working in the warehouse of Messenger International where he continues to work today packaging and shipping out materials by John and Lisa Bevere to be sent out all over the world. But John and Andrew were my spiritual fathers. To be able to work for both of them and be under both of them is, is an honor. The message of grace is something that has radically transformed my life. It wasn't until I got that message that I was truly set free. You know, if it weren't for partners, if it weren't for people that were sending Andrew enabling him to get this message out 
My life, would, I never would have heard of Andrew. I probably, I may not even be alive right now. As partners with Andrew Womack Ministries, you are helping transform the lives of people like Travis through the free teachings of God's love and grace. But I wouldn't be where I am today if it were not for the teachings of Andrew. I can't emphasize enough how powerful they are and what they've done for me. I will spend the rest of my life teaching and preaching what he's preached to me. Ready to get more out of God's Word than ever before? We gladly announce the newly recreated Andrew Womack Living Commentary. Study with Andrew from Genesis to Revelation. This Living Commentary is packed with a lifetime of Andrew's own footnotes on over 32,000 verses and counting. This extensive Living Commentary contains multiple translations of the Bible including the King James Version Plus, along with Strong's Concordance, where you can find the original Greek and Hebrew text. Andrew has also provided you with several historically respected commentaries. It's never been easier for you to study through the Bible with Andrew. Priced at only $120, this continuously updated living commentary is now available exclusively as a download for both Mac and Windows at awmi.net. Viewer supported Gospel Truth TV is free to listeners and free of charge for your favorite teachers. This is what we're hearing from people just like you receiving these messages of God's unconditional love and grace. Your teachings are transforming my life. Thank you and continue teaching the Word of God. I love, love, love being able to listen to truth and be encouraged anytime. Thank you for presenting the gospel and having teachings I can trust. I absolutely love this. Please keep it going. It is a real blessing to me. When you give to Gospel Truth TV, you're changing your life and touching countless others around the world. Click the Give button at the top or text GIVE to 719-301-2552. This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word in the midst of time periods where you're so filled with anxiety, when you're so filled with the problems of this world, the Holy Spirit will again bring to you the remembrance of God's love because it was from his love that he died for us. For God so loved the world, that included me, that included you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, that's Bob, that's you, believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. So glad you're here. I'm going to be teaching on the subject of the all-sufficient God. I'm going to be taking up maybe one, maybe two aspects of God and His greatness. So I'm offering a series called Knowing God that really brings up all the attributes of God. I'm sure I must have missed something somewhere, but it's got a lot on there. Talks about his all, uh, his power, omnipotence, his all-knowing, omniscience. It talks about his character. talks about uh, the fact that he knows the future. That's his uh, fact that he knows everything is very important. And on top of that, it deals with his sovereignty, which is so uh, misconstrued today. and People just don't understand it. So it brings it out just scripturally, makes everything easy to understand. Again, the very nature of God. So the announcer will come on at halftime, tell you how you can have a copy of that for yourself. So turn with me to Zephaniah chapter 3. And um, I like going to these Old Testament uh, obscure scriptures because it makes people stop and think, where in the world is Zephaniah? Well, go look it up in your uh, concordance or find it in the opening of your Bible and um, or else just, you know, hit it on your iPad and find it. And 
Zephaniah chapter 3, and then when you get to heaven and Zephaniah meets you, he'll say, did you ever read my book? You'll say, well, Bob taught on it one time, a section of it. So Zephaniah chapter 3, we're going to read verses 17 through 20. And here it says, the Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will say, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly who are among you, to whom its reproach is a burden. Behold, at that time I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who are driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they put the shame. At that time I will bring you back, even at the time I gather you. For I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. Although this is addressed to Israel, first their future deliverance, we know that in here because, again, it was written back here at the time. In fact, let me give you some of the background for the prophets. Most prophets dealt with issues going on in their day. And uh, we know that from the uh, book of Joel. Joel happened at a time when four major plagues had come through the land, and he takes each one of those four plagues and then uses them as an analogy of four more times when Israel's going to be coming in, the final one will destroy them, and that's in 70 AD. And so he refers to that, then adds a later one to it. He talks about the coming tribulation and the battle of Armageddon. He used something that happened in their time period that they understood. And really, we look at, we don't quite understand what he's talking about. Go back and find out what was front page news at that time, because the, 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 the uh, writers of the word of God use that. And God would use that to where the people go, oh, I see that. And that's what we do today. Ministers, don't be afraid to take what's going on today. And really, you don't have to take sides on particular issues. Uh, You can. I think when it comes to political things, you must take sides on it based on what the Word of God has to say. But if it's just general things happening in your area, what you can do is bring a story out that everybody knows about and use it as a type. Jesus did this. He made reference one time to a tower that fell over on some people and said, do you think God did that? Or do you think that happened because these people were in some kind of sin? Then he brought out, no, there's just certain things that happen because there's a curse on this earth. And he used something for their time period, even brought it out. And of course, we probably don't even have record of it today. It's just something that happened in Jesus' day, and we don't even know about it today. But because Jesus said it, it was brought out. Here in this verse of Scripture, he's talking about something that happened to them, but points to a future time of deliverance for them. Again, although this address is addressed to Israel and refers to their future deliverance from an event in their time period, it still applies to believers of all ages, but includes us today in the church age. It includes where you live. It includes your home home and includes your family. And it's simply saying the Lord will deliver you and is in your midst. It means he doesn't have to be searched for. We don't have to go look for him. He said he will never leave us nor forsake us. And even one of his titles in the Old Testament was the fact Jehovah Shammah, he is the Lord that's present. Jesus made reference to this one particular ministry of the Holy Spirit when he said the Holy Spirit who is with you shall be in you. He made reference to an Old Testament ministry that still just comes right over into the New Testament but transfers right over to the New Testament, the fact he will never leave us nor forsake us. He is the Lord Shama, the Lord who is present with us. And then Jesus said there's more ministries of the Holy Spirit yet to come. He's simply saying this passage of Scripture, an Old Testament promise, the Lord who will deliver you is in your midst. He doesn't need to be searched for because he told us in the New Testament he would never leave us nor forsake us. If there is no deliverance from God, understand this, there is no deliverance at all. We look to natural things around us. We look to our president. We look to congressmen. We vote for the right people and we should, but I don't look to them for deliverance. Deliverance comes from God. I look for momentary appeasement. I look for momentary uh, stopping of forces of evil around us, but I still know it's only momentary. I've read the end of the book. It's going to look like Satan's going to win for a while, but then Jesus is going to come back and destroy him completely. So again, if there is no deliverance from God, I repeat it, there is no deliverance at all. With him, all things are possible, but without him, we can do nothing. But we do have him with him. We're born again. He's with us. We're with him. We are like friends that walk with each other. The Bible says in the Old Testament that God walks with them. And in one case, in the case of Enoch, Enoch just suddenly disappeared. He said he walked with God and was not because God took him. Great example of us. If we live in the rapture generation, I can tell you this, we're going to be walking with God one day and suddenly we just won't be here. In fact, it's kind of like God was down here walking with Enoch and said, I enjoy walking with you, Enoch, here on this earth, but how about you go with me to my house and I'm going to show you where I live and took him up there. Of course, Enoch didn't want to come back. 
It's sad we often have to learn things for ourselves. And we usually don't listen to others who have gone through things. They're trying to warn us. Zephaniah went through a tough time. And he's simply telling us that. But he's simply saying, what I did, you can do. Because there's promises in the word of God that never change. If God promised in the New Testament, he'd never leave us nor forsake us. It's because he promised in the Old Testament, he would never leave us nor forsake us. And promises us today in the 21st century that he will never leave us nor forsake us. God doesn't want us to have the attitude, I'll learn it all by myself. How many people do that? They want to re, they want to reinvent the wheel. I've had ministers tell me, well, I'm not going to study those books that you talk about. One's written back in the 20s, 30s, 60s, whatever. I'm not even listening to a lot of ministers. I'm just going to get mine directly from the word of God. I can tell you this, the Old Testament writers wrote and the New Testament writers took it from them. They said, as it is written, as it is written. Jesus even said, as it is written. Paul said, as it is, as it is written. Revelation is built upon revelation. And listen, there's times you'll read things in the Old Testament that will blow your mind. The revelation that God gave to Zephaniah, to Zechariah, to Malachi, to the minor, the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, he gave to them. And we're still not completely understanding it today. We still find new depths of it. And then you come along and think, well, I'm not going to read all that. I'll just find it out for myself. And literally God has told us to even follow after people in Hebrews chapter 12, be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Not only can you look at Bible mem- uh, people. You not only can look at prophets of the word of God, you can look at ministers today. You can look at pastors. You can look at evangelists that live for God and look at that and in areas learn from them and apply it to your life. You can still be yourself. These ministers that say, well, I don't want to study other ministers. I don't want to follow after them. You're forgetting one of the greatest things, and that is the fact that you can still be yourself. You can take what they have learned, applied into your life, make it your own and preach it and minister it, and it'll come out as you, not as brother so-and-so. All I'm saying is God has left all these things that we keep going after, and here Zephaniah is telling us, this is the God that lives in the midst of us, the God that delivered in Zephaniah's time, the God that delivered the children of Israel through the Red Sea, the God that rained down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah, the God that brought them through and brought down the walls of Jericho is the same God that worked in Zephaniah's time. But the great news is he's still the same God today. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Ministers today, understand again, you're following the same God that led Moses, that led Joshua, that led all these people back there, and he's leading you today. Our deliverance is in us, we who are born again. Not only is he with us, He Jesus promised he would be in us. Something Zephaniah didn't have. In Zephaniah's day, in Abraham's day, in David's day, in Moses' day, the power of God was somewhere else. It was either in a tabernacle, that's a tent made out of, out of uh, badger skins and, and other skins, and then also later in a temple made out of stone. That's where the Holy Spirit Spirit's presence live, but when Jesus Christ arose from the dead, the power of the Holy Spirit was left, took out of that temple, and moved inside of us on the day of Pentecost and has been here ever since. So the Lord is not only with us in our presence, He now lives inside of us. Our deliverance that's in us is because He's been we've been born again. He's inside, dwelling in each one of us. Our body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit, and He lives inside of us. We are called the church today. A building can be called a church while we are in it. It, but we're always the church because he's always inside of us. God doesn't come to live in me on Sunday morning and then maybe once during the middle of the week. No, he lives in me all the time. So the building I go to can be called the church because I occasionally uh, go there. I go there for a service or two, but while I'm there, it's called the church. In the meantime, it's just an empty building. The reason why the Holy Spirit moved out of that place, the most expensive place in the world, practically the one of the eight wonders of the ancient world, the temple that was in Jerusalem. And Jesus even said later as he walked out of that temple that one stone will be left on another. It's going to come tumbling down. The reason why is because the Holy Spirit no longer lives there. He no longer needs that place. He lives inside of us. So again, our deliverance is in us because why? We are born again. He's inside dwelling in you and dwelling in me as well as the church, the collection of believers. This is what Zephaniah was saying. You don't have to go search the distances of the world. You don't have to chase after prophets. You don't have to go from meeting to meeting. The God that you need deliverance from is right there in your midst, but also inside of you. And that's what he's telling us. I want you to understand this, especially you ministers that are watching today. I'm telling you.
you to tell your congregation that they can get deliverance outside the church service. What you're teaching can be taken home. I mean, they don't have to come necessary to the church to have hands laid on. Have their family lay hands on them. Have them call the phone and have another person agree with them. Because we're told if two shall agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Get that across to them so they can understand this. The very God of Zephaniah, who's in the midst of them in that day, is in the midst of their family. And on top of that, when they're alone at their office, they may be in an office by themselves, the door is closed. The Holy Spirit's presence is still with them. And anything they need deliverance from is simply one simple prayer, one statement of faith away. Father, I completely trust in you to bring me through this situation. I can't do it. Without you, I can do nothing. But with you, all things are possible. That's the God we serve. I want to speak to you very quickly, too, before the break. And that is, if you're not a partner with me, would you become a partner with me? Maybe the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, maybe not. But you know what? You can purpose in your heart to be a partner with me. You don't have to have the Holy Spirit tell you everything. You're mature enough, and by actually not telling you anything, the Holy Spirit's saying, I trust you. And so if you do, then why don't you become a partner with me? Go to my website, bobyandian.com. There you'll find out how you can become a partner with me. And I thank you ahead of time, because I still have great things I want to do, and you're a part of it. And you and me together, the Bible says, if one, that's me, can put a thousand to flight, two, that's me and you can put 10,000 to flight. How about we start multiplying everyone joining me, multiplying our power 10 times. I will see you right after the break. Who is God? Is it actually possible for a mortal human to communicate with the Creator even though God is a spirit? If we truly made in God's image and likeness, how are we like God? If we share similar attributes and characteristics, what are they? This 13-lesson teaching by Bob Yandian will increase your knowledge of the God of His universe. The Bible says, if you do not love, you do not know God, because God is love. The more we know God, the greater our capacity to love. Do you want to increase your ability to love God, yourself, and those around you? As you listen to this teaching, you will be changed and become a greater expression of God in the world. In these lessons, you will learn about God's independence, His will, his infinite knowledge and greatness. You will see that he is unchanging, holy, omnipotent, faithful, good, and patient. You will learn of his mercy and also of his wrath. To order Knowing God, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Pastors, if you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, Go to bobbyandian.com forward slash invite. I want to go back to that passage of scripture I began with in Zephaniah chapter 3. I'm just going to read the first two verses, 17 and 18 of the passage that I read the first of the broadcast. The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. That's his delivering power. He will rejoice over you with gladness. God loves us and gives not unto we praise him. He praises over us. He will quiet you with his love. No matter what pressure you're going through, no matter what anxiety, no matter what frustration, he will quiet you with his love. You know what his love says? I will take care of you at all times. Then he will rejoice over you with singing. So how great it is to know the Lord who does that for us. Jesus is in his church. Not only is he in our presence, he's inside of us because we're his church. First Corinthians chapter 12 says, no one who has the spirit of God calls Jesus cursed. The Pharisees called him cursed, proving they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Why? Because all people don't have God's presence, the Holy Spirit living in them. The world is none of his. And Jesus even said that only believers are the temple of the Holy Spirit and he lives inside of us. In fact, the entire Godhead dwells in us as it did in Jesus. The Father is pleased to place all of this, all of his fullness inside of us. Colossians chapter one, verse 19. Also Colossians chapter two and verse nine. We have 
something so valuable, we have no idea the worth of it. The Bible says that this treasure dwells in earthen vessels. All we do is see the earthen vessel. We look in a mirror, we see our body. This vessel that God has t- chosen inside of us is that's kind of like when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were inside of these earthen pots and the pots were over 2,000 years old. They were so fragile. And they had to be careful how they even picked up these things because they could crack so easily and fall apart out there in the deadness of the Dead Sea and the, and the, and the low, no humidity. But we look at ourselves and we don't often, we see that. We see the fragileness of our body, but we don't see the love that God has for us because it's inside this fragile body that he has placed his righteousness. He's placed the presence of the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus Christ and his own presence inside of us. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Again, when Jesus in Matthew 24, walked out of the temple. He told his disciples, take a last look at it because not one stone will be left on another. You might as well say that to your body every day. This may be the last day I look at this body. You know what? Not one molecule will be left on top of another. This body is going to be turned back to dust. That came from dust, it's going to return back to dust. And again, we have no idea of the worth that's on the inside of us. We keep, we keep trying to keep this body up. We keep resurfacing this temple, the outside of us, and as they probably did in Jesus' day, as they kept uh, renovating it, renovating it, renovating it to make it look better and better. But that's what you have to do to your body to make it look better and better. With women, it's more makeup. It's facelifts. With men, it's just trying your best not, you know, to keep your hair and, and color your hair and all the different things you do. We don't realize how valuable the inside of us, and this is what God rejoices over. God doesn't rejoice over our body. He gives it healing while we're here on this earth, but even that's only temporary. There's no healing that will keep me here forever. I'm going to die one day. And when I do, this body that maybe could have died at 50 and lived to be 75 or 80 still was alive. But who cares if you got another 30, 35 years out of this body? The point of it is you'll be in heaven at that time. You could care less how long you lived on this earth. The fact is you're now in heaven because you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And this body that was worth nothing suddenly became the temple of the Holy Spirit and he moved inside of us. And of course, Zephaniah didn't know how to say that because there was no Holy Spirit living in him, no presence of God living in him. But he did say this, when we come together. He's in our midst and the God that's in our midst rejoices over us, sings over us because of his great love and his love will quiet us in the midst of time periods where you're so filled with anxiety. When you're so filled with the problems of this world, the Holy Spirit will again bring to you the remembrance of God's love because it was from his love that he died for us. For God so loved the world that included me, that included you, that he gave his only begotten son, That whoever, that's Bob, that's you, believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We have something so valuable we have no idea of the worth of it. If we were to be asked how much money right now we have in our wallet, we probably would know. I don't know how much money is in my wallet. In fact, there's game shows where they, they simply say, how much money is in your pocket, your pocket and your wallet? And you see people just with a blank look, they have to make an educated guess. Well, that's literally what we have. We have inside of us something so valuable, but we don't spend enough time. Now, if I did nothing but count my money three or four times a day, I can tell you exactly how much money is in my pocket and how much money is inside my wallet. If all you do is study the word of God, meditate on the things of God, then you know exactly how rich you are. If you did what Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You'll know the truth. The truth shall make you free. The sad thing is with many Christians, if we ask them, what's the word of God have to say on this situation? They'll just look at you blank. It's almost like asking how much money's in your wallet. They don't know. You're simply asking, what's the treasure inside of you right now? What scripture are you standing on? I remember when uh, we'd have people come in for counseling and uh, oftentimes it was couple that came in for counseling. And when they came in, they simply just walked in expecting us to wave a magic wand, say the name of Jesus, their problems go away. And the first thing that we would ask, in fact, we had them fill out a sheet of paper because oftentimes just filling out this sheet of paper would eliminate about 50 to 60% of the people coming in for counseling because they never had these questions asked them. Number one is what is the exact problem? And they start writing it down. Husbands uh, talk about, well, my wife does this. The wife would say, well, my husband does this. Next question is, how often have you discussed this and prayed over it with your partner? They would stop and just, uh, we don't. We just argue all the time. And then the next question really nailed it. Which scriptures are you standing on? in this situation. You know what? Lots of them at that time would send back and hand the paper back to the assistant and say, 
never mind. We don't need to come in. If those three questions just simply literally nailed it. And so if they passed those three and came in, then again, I, and they, they honestly prayed over it. They looked at the word of God. That's the person who knew how much money was in their wallet. That's the person that knew how, what promises of God were available and which ones they were standing on. And they probably had just a small question to ask to help bring them a little closer to the answer because they really knew the answer. They just didn't know the next step. Practical things to do. We have so much value in the protection of Jesus, yet we don't have any knowledge of it. My people aren't destroyed. It says for all the things that they think they are, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And it says there is knowledge in the land, but they're not stud uh, studying it. It's in the word of God. It's at their church service. It's with their minister. It's in books. But how often do people even pick it up? I even speak to pastors. Pastors, it's a warning to you. In meetings, pastors, how much time do you spend studying God's word? And they'll often think, well, you know, here, there, here, here, here. And I said, you know what? You waste your time. You probably spend more time listening to country music than you do listening to a tape or a CD of the word of God or a flash drive. You spend more time listening to classic rock music than you do listening to something in your car. What if you took a CD, put it in your car, and by the time you drove to the church office and drove back home, you could listen to an entire sermon. How much would that change your life? And I've had men who've actually made that commitment. Okay, I'm going to start doing that. And you know what? Within a week, they said, I never knew how much of a radical change even one week would do of the word of God. Well, imagine a lifetime of it, how much revelation could become. You say, yeah, but I kind of miss my rock music. Not when you start studying God's word. You won't even think a thing about it. On top of that, when you get to heaven, you could care less how much rock music, country music, or whatever you listen to. Uh, news, you know, people just get obsessed with listening to the news all the time on the radio. It's all they have going on the car. What difference does it make? Because the news changes next week. Whatever stand the president made this week is over next week. And there's a new problem, a new crisis coming along. Why don't you do what Zephaniah did and say, it's not my knowledge of news going on. It's not all these other things. It's my knowledge of the word of God. Jesus Christ is in the midst of me in my family, in my church, but he's also inside of me. And this is what I have. To study God's word tells you just how wealthy you really are in the things of God. God's word, his Holy Spirit, his love and protection over us cannot even be calculated. It's worth so much more than just the financial things you have or just the assets you have in your life. You cannot allow yourself to be taken in by the world or caught up in its thought processes. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to look with me at verses 3 through 6. Here it says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. In other words, I've got fists. I could use them, but this is what not what God wants. I could even know self-defense and could level most anybody coming at me, but I do not war according to the flesh. On top of that, this flesh gets old. This body gets old. Have you ever seen great athletes, football players and stuff from the past and look at them today? They can barely get around. Their body just couldn't take it all those years. The same thing even with people that know self-defense. Later in life, they're stiff, everything else, they couldn't defend themselves anymore. But the word of God continues to increase in power. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means fleshly. Next of all, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. These are satanic strongholds, life strongholds, uh, situations that arise in our life. And it says, casting down reasonings and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This is what Zephaniah was saying. Only through God do we have real deliverance. If God isn't my answer, then there is no answer because God should be my own only answer. You say, yeah, but I, you know, I pray, but natural things begin to occur. That's what God did. God doesn't come in your face and send angels every time. He begins to work through situations and what you thought was impossible suddenly starts to fall into place. You go, oh my goodness, I see what you're talking about, Lord. So again, verse five, casting down reasonings and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. In other words, it comes back to that. Not only does God again, deliver us. But I love what it said in Zephaniah. He rejoices over us with singing and with joy. Like a mother who loves her baby and thinks it's the most beautiful thing on earth, so God thinks of us. God loves us more than any natural mother or natural father, any earthly parent can. It says he literally dances over us with joy. This is 
is the God that blesses us. Again, the God that moves inside of us. He dances over us with singing and with joy. And then next of all, I'll finish on this one today. We'll just continue this tomorrow. Our God is a warrior. It doesn't matter how bad the situation is we're going through. God is always greater, more powerful than and any problem we can have. Again, I just want to admonish you. Thank you again, all you're watching today. I just want to thank you for joining me each and every day. Even if you're not a partner, you know what? You're important. The fact you watch this broadcast, many of you who have not sent in any finances or anything like that, and maybe you can't afford to send in anything. I want you to understand how important you are. I will meet you in heaven. Let me tell you another great asset is to take the things you've learned here and spread it to other people. In your Sunday school classes, teach it. Just sharing it one-on-one. We'll never know the effect of this till we get to heaven. The accumulative effect, one after another, of people that were changed by the message of the Word of God, including my teaching here. Thanks again for watching. You know what? Spread the Word around. Begin to tell other people about this broadcast because you know what? If it changes your life, it'll change their life. I know the Word of God changed my life, and it keeps on producing over and over and over again. See you tomorrow. We'll continue on with this. Ministers, you can access valuable resources free at ministersclub.com. You'll find topical studies, sermon outlines, PDF books, answers to many questions, and plenty of encouragement, all free. Just go to ministersclub.com. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, Use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian. You know, I've got great news for those of you who've been wanting to partake of Keras, but you just can't move. You can't seem to uh, find how to fit it into your schedule. We now have what we call e on this little iPad and you get all of the first year courses here. There's a total of 39 courses, eight hours teaching per course. So that I think is 312 hours worth of teaching. It's loaded on here so that you don't have to have an internet connection. It comes with headphones, wireless headphones. And this way you can take advantage of the first year of CARES curriculum, whatever your situation is. And you can interact with our staff. You take tests. They know where you are in this process. It's just a great way to take advantage of it. Check it out. E. Karras. You are supported. Gospel Truth TV is free to listeners and free of charge for your favorite teachers. This is what we're hearing from people just like you receiving these messages of God's unconditional love and grace. Your teachings are transforming my life. Thank you. When you give to Gospel Truth TV, you're changing your life and touching countless others around the world. Click the Give button at the top or text GIVE to 719-301-2552. Karen Conrad serves as Vice President of Wealth Builders. She is a consultant, teacher, author, and maintains a successful real estate and home staging business that has been featured on the Lifetime Television Network. Welcome to Living with Karen Conrad. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Keys to Success. This is part four today, and we are covering it just to bring out some more uh, experiences that I've had recently and kind of go a little bit deeper into some of the points. You know, whether you are trying to start a business, maybe you have a business, maybe it's just something in your personal life, spiritual life, whatever it might be, these keys are all founded in the Word of God and they help in every area of our life. So let's get started with key number 10. All right, it is persistence and perseverance. Are you ready for this? It comes through enduring difficulties. (laughs) I know that's like not what we really want to hear. It's like, what? You may have to go through difficulties to gain perseverance. But you know what? It, It does, but it doesn't mean that it has to be difficulties that someone else inflicts on you. 
although God definitely uses those times. But really, difficulties are putting us self in, ourselves in positions of challenge or facing difficulties um, is a really healthy way to bring about perseverance. So one of the examples I'd like to use is that if we, um, let's just say we want to start a ministry, if we went for 10 years without any sort of difficulty or anything we had to work through, we would get used to that, that everything is just going to be perfect, right? And then all at once, if we're into it and we've grown to a certain point and maybe we're at 10 years uh, and challenges start to come our way, we really wouldn't know how to handle them. It's one of those things that I think we have to build up to. And as I'm talking about this, I'm just reminded of an athlete. Uh, for example, my son Levi's always uh, loved uh, competition and being an athlete. And recently he took up, and so did my husband actually, this thing called a one wheel. And it's got one wheel in the middle. It's sort of like a skateboard, but it's got a wheel that turns itself with a motor. So you have to balance on it. And um, it's actually quite exciting. And uh, my husband's taken a few spills. We count the scabs on his body just to give you an idea. But anyway, it's one of those things where it kind of causes them to have to challenge themselves and to get themselves in a position to face adversity, um, maybe competition, even if it's just with themselves, but facing something difficult physically to help push them to that next level. One of the things that Dave and I do on an every other day basis is we do something called the Gree Pilates. <laughs> and it's really just a machine. There's nothing special about Pilates or the Gree, but it just really forces you to concentrate and really push your muscles. And so we started doing that shortly after we got married because we realized like, you know what? We need a challenge in our physical life. And so we've got ourselves on a schedule with that. And there's days where it's like, oh my goodness, are you feeling that workout? Yes, are you? Well, it would be easier just to say, you know what? We're in our upper 50s, early 60s. We don't need to do this anymore. But we just find yourself that we want to push ourselves. And as we do that, we are able to gain additional perseverance and persistence. So why is this important? Do you know, 